Praise the Lord. Oh, for all of our members, extended members online, our friends and friends we have not yet met, we welcome you this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are continuing our ongoing Bible study, which I have titled um, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. We're looking at all things paranormal from a biblical Christian perspective. And in the process of this, we, we, began, um, we began by looking at uh, the necessity of accepting and, and uh, embracing the Word of God as our foundation. Uh, most so-called paranormal experts and ghost hunters and uh, however you want to call it, um, they have a habit of um, quoting, you know, various other uh, people who have been involved in these uh, endeavors for years. And they say, well, you know, um, this uh, ghost hunter says this, and that one says that, and and this so-called paranormal expert says this, and what makes them an expert? Um, what authority are they basing any of the information that they're offering people as fact? What information, what authority are they using uh, to establish what they're saying as being absolute fact, immutable fact. And the reality is that most of the time you'll hear them say, you know, uh, well, some say this and others say this and blah, blah, blah. And if you watch three different, four different paranormal television shows, you will see a variety of um, uh diagnosis, I guess you could say, of the situation. You know, if you send the Roto-Rooter guys into a, a haunted situation, they always come out every single time, every single time. They always come out saying, oh, I don't think it's trying to hurt you. I don't think it's anything bad. You know, you just need to learn to live with it. You know, it, 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 don't worry about it. And oh, and then they, they, the last scene of the show is them bragging to each other about what a great job they did and high-fiving each other. Uh, oh, you know, I think they'll be good now that we've told them that everything's good and they have nothing to fear. There's nothing to worry about. And on what authority? Where, where do they get the information that allows them to offer that kind of advice to their so-called clients. Now, if you invite Amy Allen in from another paranormal television show, she may come into the identical same situation, the same home, the same building, and she'll turn around and say, oh, there's aliens here. Not only are there aliens, but oh my, there's so many dead. There's a portal here. And oh, and, and one of them is so angry and he wants to kill women. And, you know, I mean, come on, folks. Think, think. Use your minds for a moment. You wind up with so many. And if you watch these shows, Tommy and I watch several of them at times. If you watch these shows many, many times, they cover the same identical buildings, the same identical structures, the same identical homes, and they come out with altogether different uh, diagnosis as to what's going on. So, as children of God, we embrace the Word of God as absolute immutable fact and truth. When it comes to things of a spiritual nature, it is imperative that as a Christian, we embrace a biblical Christian perspective and a biblical Christian understanding of these things. And if you do, I promise you, people who have struggled with these issues for years and years and cannot um, 
seem to get victory, cannot seem to overcome, uh, wind up being chased around the country by, you know, uh, spiritual influences. Uh, they can find the victory they need if they will accept the Word of God as their authority. So, uh, that was our first session. Then our second session, we were talking about the reality, the absolute reality of the spirit world. I don't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, whatever. The reality is there is a spirit realm where we differ as our ministry is a full gospel, spirit-filled Pentecostal ministry, and therefore where we differ from many uh, church denominations and organizations is in understanding uh, how these uh, realms um, infringe upon the natural world in the modern age. Uh, the Baptists and certain ones will tell you, oh, you know, there's no such thing as demons. There's no, you know, they'll hear my teaching and they're going to say, oh, no, you know, there's no such thing as ghosts. There's no such thing as demons. There's no such thing. Those things can't do anything in the world today. That was just biblical uh, drama. You know, God just did that in Bible days, you know, to put on a good show so we'd have a really cool book to read. But those things don't, you know, don't exist today. Wrong. The spirit realm is very real. When you're looking at the spirit realm, you have two sides. You have good and you have evil. You have God and, of course, the devil. We started out looking at the spirit realm. We looked at the uh, order of the spirit realm. You start with God, then you go to angels, okay, because they're directly, they are the first creations of God, the angels. And so we were looking at angels. We're going to finish up today a real quick pass through on some passages related to angels. <clears throat> In reading them, there are just some real basic little truths we can extract concerning angels. And then the way that I have this study structured, what I'm going to do, it's a little bit different. The next thing we're going to talk about, and we may be able to get to it today, we're going to talk about the concept of spiritual warfare. The fact that there are opposing sides in the spirit realm. And then once we've looked at that, the concept of opposing sides then we're going to look at the other side. Now, then we're going to begin to look at demons, evil spirits, devils, whatever you want to call them. And uh, we're going to take it from there, okay? As the study progresses, we're going to look very specifically at uh, the concept of hauntings. We're going to look at uh, possession. We're going to look at all kinds of wonderful things. It is amazing to me how easily people can get caught up looking at the negative side of the spirit world. You know, people, oh, they just love the concept of ghosts and goblins and ghouls. But they, you know, probably many people got bored with our Bible study early on because we started with the Word of God. Then we started with the spirit realm and God, of course, being at the head of the spirit realm, angels. Oh, I don't want to look at that. You know, I want to talk about ghosts. I want to talk about goblins. I want to talk about, you know, hauntings and vexations and curses and uh, demon possession and all those good things. Those are not good things. But we're here to help people, okay? this I've been involved in a, a deliverance ministry is what we term it, uh, meaning that we're able to help people who are dealing with demonic influences, spiritual influences, and um, help them to overcome and win the battle and to be free. I've been involved in this since I started ministry as a young man. 
uh, started pastoring at the age of 19. And uh, at 19 years old, I was casting demons out of people and the, 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 the changes, instant changes that you see in a human being's life when they are delivered from demonic possession and oppression is mind-blowing. If you had ever seen some of the cases that I've seen, I'm telling you right now, folks, uh, you would know for a fact that demons are real because when someone's possessed by demons and they are delivered, the change is instant and it is mind-blowing. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. A person can go from from appearing to be completely insane and out of their mind uh, to sane as a judge and with the right mind in a matter of seconds. It just, boom, like that. And um, it is a wonderful, wonderful thing to behold. I have seen it on many, many occasions. And so, the reason that I teach things in the order that I'm teaching them is because we're not just here to play games. We're not just here to entertain you talking about ghosts and all these things, no, and hauntings and etc. the paranormal. We are here to help people overcome. We're here. This teaching is being offered so that hopefully as you go through it, people who may be struggling with some of these things will be getting the education and the information they need to build their faith and establish their faith in God, to, to strengthen their walk with God, and in the process to ultimately break the chains that are binding them, break whatever it is that is vexing them and causing them such grief and consternation. And as people are listening, you know, as we're talking about angels, I was saying the other day, uh, people don't realize, but when you look at the, the uh, truth about angels as it's presented in the Word of God, it's very exciting. Because people readily accept the idea that there are demons roaming around and the devil's out there to get you. But what they don't realize is that the Word of God teaches that there are angels roaming around. That God has angels, in effect, on patrol. And so help is always available to you. We don't. We don't pray to angels. We don't ask angels to do anything that is not our job. The angels are always at the command of God. Be like the President of the United States. You know, you can go to a soldier and ask him to go help you, you know, do something at your house or whatever, but he still has to receive his orders through command. And the same is true of angels. We don't talk to angels. We don't pray to angels. There's no such thing as using angels as our guides, so to speak. No. Uh, our relationship with angels is they are there for us. God uses them to minister, to do things on our behalf, but they answer to God. So if we need the assistance of angels, uh, the best we can do is say, Lord, please send angels to fight this battle for me. Please send angels to do thus and so. But you do not pray to or uh, seek to communicate directly with angels any more than you do the dead. All right, we're going to move into this Bible study. As I've said, I'm kind of going to do a real quick run through of several passages from the Word of God that speak of angels. And there's just little truths that we'll be able to glean from these many different passages about angels. But I kind of want to do a, a flash session and try to get through that so that maybe we can actually get into the, um, the spiritual warfare uh, aspect of our study today, okay? Before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Master Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God, for this opportunity to be with our friends, 
our members uh, were extended members online. Master, this is important subject matter. Many people suffer at the hands of demonic influences and evil spirits and wickedness. And Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that as this teaching goes forth, let our faith be inspired to new heights and help those that are struggling in a, a, a battle today with the powers of darkness. Help them, Lord, to reach out toward heaven, to call out to you and to receive the divine assistance and deliverance that they need. Help us, O oh God, tonight by reason of your anointing to teach with power in love so the people of God and those who are listening might be able to receive that which we are speaking. Help it, Lord, not merely to fall upon deaf ears, but help the listener to have a heart that is cultivated, prepared, ready to receive from the Word of God. We ask it all today in none other than the precious saving name of Jesus the Christ, even Yeshua. Amen. Praise God and amen. Now, there are a number, I'm not going to read them all in full context, simply because that would take us weeks to do so, okay? Uh, We'll start, we're going to start out in Luke chapter 20 and verse 36. This passage reads, Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Here, therefore, we see, first of all, we know the word of God said man was created a little lower than the angels. In the order of creation, it says man was created a little lower than the angels. After death, however, this passage tells us that we will be equal unto the angels. How are we going to be equal? In that death will no longer be a reality for us as God's children. Uh, angels were created eternal. Whenever God creates something of a spiritual nature, it is eternal. It does not end. It does not die. It does not cease to exist. Everything that is spirit has no expiration date. Now, we talked about it in previous studies. The soul that sinneth it shall die. The soul can die, but the spirit does not die. The spirit lives on. For the believer, not only does the spirit live on, but the word of God promises that their soul will live on. And the benefits of that is that the soul is able to experience uh, things and uh, enjoy things that a spirit cannot there are things that in a spirit form you can't enjoy and you can't appreciate. But the soul, which is the, the uh, spiritual body that God has prepared as a house, as a covering, as clothing, as it were, for our spiritual man, that is uh, something that allows us to enjoy any number of things. If you remember, the Bible said God created Adam in the Garden of Eden. God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and he became a living soul. As a living soul, they were able to eat from the trees. They were able to enjoy the fruit of the trees. So there were things that the living soul was able to benefit from and enjoy that a spirit would not have access to, okay? All things spiritual, remember that. All things spiritual are without an expiration date, okay? Then, of course, in Luke 24, 23, uh, this is around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they also seen a vision of angels which said he was 
alive. So when God wants to communicate something in a powerful way, in a dramatic way, in a way that is unique so that it in effect stands out. You know, when we're typing on our computer, we use italics or we use a bold print. When God wants to say something with italics or with bold print, oftentimes he uses angels. They are there to convey a message. When Jesus had risen from the dead, the Lord wanted to make a statement in bold print because if they had simply come and found the tomb empty. The assumption, of course, would have been, uh-oh, the body's been stolen or, you know, somebody's up to no good. So in order for the uh, people to know what had happened, God obviously could have spoken out of heaven. You know, there's a million ways he could have done it. But when the Lord's trying to say something dramatic and powerful, when he's making uh, a really important point, so to speak, he often will use his angels to convey the message. In the case of the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection, the angels conveyed that message. In John 151, he saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So the angels minister to us in our struggles, in our difficulties. The Lord was speaking um, to the fact that his mission was not an easy mission and that the, the uh, disciples were actually going to bear witness to the fact that the angels of God were continually ministering to him, just like when the Lord was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and he only had his three brethren with him, Peter, James, and John. And we have the record that they saw angels ministering to him. How else could they have written this in the Gospels? Uh, but there, the angels of God were ministering to the Lord in that hour of great grief and sorrow and struggle. So we know that God can also send angels to minister to us. But luckily, as a child of God, we have a direct relationship with God. And God is declared not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So the, the Lord generally ministers to the people of God directly. It's spirit to spirit, his spirit with our spirit. But he can minister to us by reason of angels. Um, John chapter 20, verse 12, also around the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saith unto him, I'm sorry, uh, John 20, 12, And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. So again, this is a, a, the same thing we read about earlier, the angels in the tomb to testify to the resurrected Christ. In Romans chapter 8, 38, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about the fact that there is nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And he says in Romans 8, 38, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, listen, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. He's talking about things that one would think may be able to uh, interfere with or interrupt the Lord's love for us. And he's talking about things that have, uh, at least in most people's mind, that has the potential to disrupt the connection that we have with God and the love of God. And he says, uh, neither death nor life nor angels, 
nor principalities, nor powers. So again, we see that hierarchy that we talked about in our previous Bible study. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul said, Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. As born-again children of God, as fallen man, we are a little lower than the angels. However, at the moment of the resurrection, at the time of the rapture of the church, when God's people are called up to glory, when we're glorified, when we put on our new body, which is fashioned by God's own hand, the wonderful thing is we at that point actually are going to be a step above the angels rather than a step below. Hallelujah. We'll be switching out positions and God's people will be in a higher position as the children of God and the angels will be beneath us and we actually will be in a position at that time to judge the angels. Now what's important here is I told you before, uh, people have to understand that the concept of angels is not strictly holy. In other words, the, the demons are angels. They're, they're, in effect, they too are angels, okay? Uh, they are not fallen angels. I'm going to be getting into that in a little while. That is, as far as I'm concerned, that is a false teaching and, and unscriptural. It's based on one passage of Scripture. And if you honestly read the passage of Scripture in context, it's abundantly clear that it's not describing the fall of of Lucifer and the angels. It's talking about a war in heaven uh, in the last days uh, prior to the, the Lord returning to earth and establishing his thousand-year reign and so on and so forth. It's talking about a final literal battle in heaven and Satan is cast down, says a third of the stars are basically pulled out of the sky by him and they try to say, oh, that means a third of the angels fell. There is no support for that notion anywhere in the Word of God. We've read it. We've studied it. We've talked about it. If you missed any of our earlier sessions, you need to go back and look at it. The Word of God says as plain as day, God created both good and evil. Those demons, those spirits... Those angels, which are evil spirits, whereas gods are holy. That's why we talked about the notion of uh, they're referred to as holy angels. Well, why would you call them holy angels if all angels are holy? Then, you know, uh, but all angels, quote unquote, are not holy. You have holy angels and you have wicked, you have evil angels in effect. Uh, again, if you look at the story of Job, you see that uh, the Word of God said the sons of God, speaking of angels, uh, were coming before the Lord. They were presenting themselves to the Lord, and uh, Satan was among them. He was one of them who was coming, uh, because the reality is all of the spirit world Listen to me, folks. This, this is good and important. All of the spirit world is on God's payroll. Every spirit there is. If you look in the Old Testament, and I'm going to be showing you this in a little bit when we get to demons, you'll see where the Word of God said that God said, I will send them a lying spirit said, you know, this guy doesn't want to know the truth. He doesn't want to believe the truth. You know, these Trump folks don't want to believe the truth. He said, I'll send them a strong delusion, the Word of God said in the New Testament. He says in uh, the Old Testament concerning certain kings and leaders, he said, I'll send them a lying spirit that'll tell them something that's entirely wrong. 
so that they can make the wrong decision based on false information. Why? Because that's what they want. They want to do what they want to do. They want to believe what they want to believe. So the Lord said, fine, I'll send them a spirit that is going to advise them to do exactly what they want to do, to believe exactly what they want to believe. This is why, again, it is so imperative as children of God that we have a love of the truth. The Word of God teaches in the last days that there be many whose love of the truth is going to wax cold, and they're going to believe a lie. And the Word of God said that the Lord will send them a strong delusion. He's literally going to allow a spirit of delusion to overtake these people. It's like, hey, you know what? You want to sell yourself out to falsehood. You want to sell yourself out to lies and misinformation. Then fine, I'm going to let you do that. In fact, I'll help you to do that. Okay? When we give ourselves over to anything, we open ourselves up to spiritual activity. Okay? When we give ourselves over to goodness, when we give ourselves over to love, when we give ourselves over to charity, when we give ourselves over to compassion, empathy, sympathy, the Spirit of God is invited into our lives and the Spirit of the Lord will be able to work through us and work with us and work in us. If we give ourselves over to angst, and anger, if we give ourselves over to revenge, if we give ourselves over to vengeance, this is why the Word of God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. We have to, as children of God, we must respond in every emotional situation. We must respond in a godly, biblical, Christian manner. That is how we prevent anything of a negative nature from gaining access to our life. When you allow yourself to uh, become angry and you give yourself permission. I know so many Christians today who literally have just given themselves permission to be mad and to be angry all the time. And they live their lives angry. I have a cousin when I went up north for my uncle's <clears throat> celebration of life. Uh, one of my cousins who's a big Donald Trump supporter as it turns out, I didn't know that, but I found out. Uh, she was telling me, um, and she's supposed to be a born-again child of God. And listen to this. She was telling me, well, one of the ways you can tell that all these politicians are in cahoots with one another, you know, it's not a matter of being a Republican versus a Democrat. It's a matter of being a Trump worshiper versus a Democrat, because the Trump cult has trained people and taught people not to trust either side, only trust us. So she turns around and says, well, the way you know that the Republicans and the Democrats are in bed with one another, and they're all playing the same game, you know, they're all, they're all just doing the same thing, and, you know, uh, that's why we need somebody to go in there and really shake things up, because they're all in cahoots with one another. And how does she know this? Because uh, well, you see pictures of them at events and stuff, and they're sitting together, and they're talking, and they're laughing, Democrats and Republicans, and you hear about how, you know, this Republican was such a great friend of this Democrat, and blah, blah, and she said, you know, look, so they're just playing games. No, they're not playing games. No, politically, they have very different beliefs and very different views, very different perspectives. And when it comes to the Senate floor, when it comes to the House floor, they debate, they argue, they do what they got to do related to policy and bills that are, uh, uh, you know, up for a vote. Um, 
But that doesn't mean they have to be angry with each other 24-7. They have to be hateful. They have to be malicious toward one another 24-7. But my born-again so-called cousin has the attitude that they should be. Because they have different views on abortion, because they have different views on this issue or that issue, they ought to be mad at each other 24-7. They should be hateful to one another. They shouldn't even begin to act like they like one another. What a hideous, evil, wicked, horrendous attitude for a child of God to take. And what these people do not know, and some of you watching may very well be Trump worshipers and Trump supporters. Well, I'm warning you right now, you don't have to like what I have to say, but I'm going to tell you right now, that man oozes demon spirits. That man oozes demonic spirits. I discern so many devils pouring off of him, and everywhere he goes, those spirits literally, it, it's like those spirits just turn the crowd into raving lunatics. And the crowd, many of whom claim to be born-again Christians, wind up adopting the same hatefulness, the same maliciousness, the same anger, the same angst, that this guy is demonstrating and manifesting at the podium. Well, I'm going to tell you something. He's a carrier. Just like people can carry a virus, he is a carrier. Adolf Hitler was a carrier. People who did not guard their conduct, who did not embrace the word of God as their foundation and their final authority. And the word of God said, love your enemies, do good unto them which spitefully use you. The word of God teaches us to behave in a manner that is completely contrary to the manner with which the world conducts itself. And yet there are so many Christians today who have sold their soul to the devil. They have allowed themselves to literally invite spiritual influences into their lives, which just feeds, feeds, feeds on hatred, feeds on anger, feeds on angst. Everything, And then what do they do? That, that spirit will encourage them to listen to uh, things, listen to news channels, listen to programs that is going to just further stir all that negativity and all that angst. And yet the Word of God said, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are pure. Um, all, he goes down a list of all these wonderful attributes, said if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So we are called to filter all that negative crapola out. If we're going to keep negative demonic influences from taking hold in our lives and dragging us places we don't want to go and causing us to be something God has not called us to be so that ultimately we miss heaven because we become an unprofitable servant. We are not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And Jesus said it is the will of God that we bear much Fruit. What fruit do you think he's talking about? Changing the abortion laws? Changing laws concerning gay marriage? That's not fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, so on and so forth. And he said it is the will of God that we bear much fruit. If we're not bearing that fruit, we have become unprofitable servants. Read the Word of God. Look at the parables in which the Lord Jesus Christ talks about unprofitable servants. Look at what their end is. The Word of God said, the, uh, uh, with the talents, you know, the man with the five, the two, the one, the, the one who was deemed unprofitable, the Word of God said, he was cast into outer darkness, <clears throat> excuse me, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth 
unprofitable servants will reap the same end as unbelievers. Okay? Because the reality is, in the end, they are unbelievers. They don't believe the Word of God at all. Honey, if you're not even making an honest effort to live what the Word of God teaches, the Lord said, you're my servants indeed. If, if, if you do what I say. Now, that's not to say you can't fall short. That's not to say, you know, you can, uh, that you're going to hell because you're less than perfect. No, that's not it at all. But God knows when someone is even making a sincere effort and when somebody is just playing the game and they're using what the way the Apostle Paul worded it, he said they're using their, uh, their cloak of righteousness as a uh, a tool of maliciousness. You know, they're using it so that they can be malicious, so they can be mean, so they can be hateful, so that basically they can be the best ungodly person that you can possibly be. They're doing ungodliness beautifully. They're, <laughs> they're living an ungodly life marvelously. They're hateful, they're malicious, they're mean-spirited, they're cruel, they lack empathy, they lack uh, sympathy, they have no love for anybody, uh, at, at least outside of their church. You know, uh, folks, that is the dangerous ground that so many believers are walking on today. And I'm telling you, I know Christians, I have some in my family who have demons People say, well, you can't be a Christian and have a demon. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. Don't you think you can? First of all, not everybody who claims Christianity is a Christian. You need to understand that. So, therefore, uh, somebody who identifies as a Christian, somebody who professes Christianity they most definitely can have a demon because in reality, they do not have a walk with God like they're supposed to have. They have not obeyed the true gospel. They've not obeyed the apostolic plan of salvation. They have not obeyed the word of God. And therefore, they are a Christian in name only. They're, they just claim to be a Christian. So yes, people who call themselves Christians can have demons all day and all night. And I know any number of Christian people who have demons. I have an aunt uh, up north who is as hateful and as spiteful and as malicious, as cruel, as uncaring, as uh, unempathetic. Oh, my God. I could go down a list a mile long. As anybody you've ever seen in your life. But she'll be the first one to try to tell you she's a born-again child of God, ready for heaven. She's got the big Bible passages in her window at her house. You know, she got the bumper stickers on her car. Oh, my, my, my. When we get into demons, you're going to find out that there are things, uh, there is such a thing as what we call religious spirits, meaning there are spirits that influence people in religious ways to be hyper-religious. But at the same time, they're about as spiritual as a grapefruit. There's no depth to their walk with God. They don't have a walk with God. They think they do. They'll tell you they do. But where's the fruit? Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruit. Honey, if the fruit ain't there, I don't give a flying fig if they've been going to church for 75 years and been baptized 400 times <clears throat> and claim they're a born-again child of God. No, if the fruit is not present, then the reality is they are not what they claim. That is the bottom line.
As children of God, we must always, always guard ourselves against opening a door to a negative spiritual influence. When you open the door, the first thing that comes into an open door is going to be basically a, a, a private in the army, okay? It's going to be the weaker spirits. It's going to be a spirit uh, that doesn't have a lot of power, can't do a whole lot, but his job, his sole job is to motivate you and encourage you to further open the door, open it a little wider. Go ahead, you know, you have a right to be angry. You have a right to be mad, you know. Go ahead. The Word of God said, be angry, but sin not. Says it uh, a little, you know, being angry, you know, it's kind of like um, John Lewis said, you know, good trouble. You know, there's such a thing as good anger. Anger a lot of times motivates people to do good things. You know, they say, hey, I better get on this uh, bandwagon. I better do something about this issue because I've experienced something that made me mad and it helped me to realize I need to do something about this in our society, in our laws, in our world, whatever the case might be. But that's that's allowing anger to operate within the context confines that it belongs. But when we allow that spirit, that first spirit that comes in, can simply be a spirit of anger. What that ain't, what that spirit of anger does is he encourages you at every turn to feed him. Okay? Give me more anger. Give me more anger. Let, let's watch this news. Let's watch this uh, uh, station. Let's watch this program. Because it's going to further incite anger in you. It's going to make you angrier and madder and madder. And as you're getting angrier and angrier, that door begins to fly open. It begins to be pushed open, your spiritual door into your life. And as that door opens wider, more powerful spirits begin to move in. And spirits that are uh, have much more influence and much more power begin to come in. They always come in in succession. They always come in uh, basically uh, based on their level of ability and their their level of influence. So the weaker comes in first, and then it gets greater and greater. All of a sudden, instead of just being angry, now you've opened the door to maliciousness. Now, not only are you angry, but now you're just mean to other people because you're angry at what they believe and angry at what they do and angry at all things you don't need to be angry at because none of your business. And this is one reason why the Word of God teaches us, in effect, to mind our own business. That's what the Word of God teaches, folks. i got news for you. Paul said, you have faith, have it unto yourself. You're not supposed to be running around pushing your convictions and your specific beliefs on everybody else. No, you walk with God. The Word of God teaches that every man work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. You work out your own walk with God. In the meantime, love everybody. You should be able to love the homosexual. You should be able to love the drunkard. You should be able to love the drug addict. What identifies a child of God is not uh, the stance they take on abortion or the stance they take on gay rights. No. What identifies a child of God is their ability to love. When you see a Christian who has that unique ability to just love people, love everybody, whatever their political leaning, whatever their beliefs, whatever their actions, whatever their conduct, whatever their lifestyle, whatever their sexual orientation. Honey, you know that you're in the presence of a true born-again believer because that is the earmark of a child of God, the ability to to love. Okay, now I've done gone off on a caveat there. <clears throat> so, uh,
Colossians 2.18, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Children of God are admonished by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Colossians. We do not engage in the worship of angels. But furthermore, it was interesting, Paul said, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. One of the things that always gets me about paranormal studies and paranormal research and all this these people go into environments, they go into buildings, they go into structures, they go into situations, and uh, they have all these tools that they believe are able to communicate with the spirit realm. And I am not saying that I do not believe the spirit realm uses those tools I don't think they need those tools. That Listen to me carefully. They, they don't need those tools. But if they think you're, you know, you're using it thinking you'll be able to communicate with these dead people, these spirits are more than happy to work through these devices. It's just the same way they'll work through a Ouija board or tarot cards, okay? Doesn't bother them one way or the other. You're using... Uh, Basically, you're using tools of divination. Even a lot of these electronic devices that people have created and that are so popular in the world today, folks, those devices are tools of divination, okay? And so uh, they'll be communicating with something. You know, they're getting words. They're getting phrases. They're getting, and it always ceases to amaze me, always, Every one of these people, without fail, automatically believe every single word that comes to them through whatever medium they're using, whether it be a Ouija board, whether it be a, uh, uh, you know, I forget what they call their little electronic devices, you know, uh, whatever the case might be, they believe every word that something, I don't say someone, I say something that is invisible is communicating to them. If somebody walked into my house today and uh, introduced themselves and said, Hi, my name is Mary. I'm a descendant of uh, the, the Russian uh, monarchy, you know, oh, my ancestry goes way back to, you know, the uh, monarchy that once existed in uh, Russia and blah, 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 blah. Would I necessarily believe that person upon hearing this? No, no. Why? Because people lie. People will tell all kinds of stories to try. People will make up stories to get you to pity them. People will give you stories to come across like they're something they're not or someone they're not. You know, people tell all kinds of stories in the flesh. When you're looking right at them face to face, people will lie to you right to your face. Why in the world would anyone be so foolish as to think you can communicate with something that is unseen and everything they say is going to be fact. Why would you believe that? Why would you? What on earth makes you think? Even if you believe you're communicating with a ghost, a departed person, what makes you think that that person so called in the in the afterlife uh, doesn't want to um, play games what makes you think they don't want to tell a fib or lie to you for any number of reasons what makes you think so oh well no ghosts don't tell lies they just automatically tell the truth where do you get that what authority do you have where in the world is it written where in the world is there any proof 
that the spirit realm always tells the truth. Okay? But this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about to the church, to the Colossian church. He said, they intrude into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So they venture into the world of the unseen, and their brain is convincing them, boy, that they know what they're doing, and they know who they're dealing with, and they know who they're talking to. Oh, boy, I mean, I've figured it all out. I've, I've read all these books. I've had all these different uh, authors and experts say this, that, and the other thing. Of course, there are a thousand other books just like religion. There's a thousand other books they could have read, would have told them the exact opposite, everything they've learned, okay? So, uh, what makes you think that these things are telling you the truth? You need to be careful. This is why we don't worship angels. This is why we do not, as believers, we do not ever consult with or deal with the unseen world, okay? We do not try to communicate with the dead. We do not try to communicate with so-called ghosts or spirits at any level, okay? Because that is unseen, and it is people whose minds are vainly puffed up, who think that, you know, they're so smart, they can just rush into these things. No, you're playing with fire, okay? It's a very dangerous uh, road to go down. Um, in Hebrews 2 and 5, the Apostle Paul said, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak and this is what i was talking about before that god's people are actually going to be elevated above the angels rather than being just below the angels um, because god has not subjected the world to come he has not made that for them that is for us as god's people okay um In Hebrews 2.16, here's one for the Jehovah's Witness community that wants to believe that uh, Jesus was Michael the archangel. Wrong. Um, in Hebrews 2.16, it said, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. If he had been Michael the archangel to begin with, why would he need to take on the nature of angels? He was an angel to start with. So how could he, why would he take on the nature of angels if he already is an angel, okay? So no, uh, Jesus Christ was not by a million miles Michael the archangel. Uh, let's move further. This one is very important. Hebrews 13, 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. This tells us that angels can, in fact, appear in the natural world. They can appear as flesh and blood. They can interact with us as a human being. Uh, they will do so as a stranger, not somebody you know. Your grandma ain't going to show up. You, the, you know, the angel's not going to show up to you looking like grandma. The angel's not going to show up to you looking like grandpa. Uh, no, because that would be breaking God's own rule concerning interaction with the dead. We know, according, to, and we're going to get into this more in the, in the future, so keep your... Uh, keep your computer tuned in. But we know, again, the dead have no, according to the word of God, they have no inheritance. They literally are disconnected entirely from the natural world. That's what the word of God teaches. So therefore, if that's what the word of God said, God's not going to break his own word by having the dead show up at your door to help you or to do something for you, okay? 
uh, we'll be talking, I, I'm not going to get into that too much because I'm going to be talking about why that happens in a future study and why it appears as though this happens. And people say, well, but my grandmother showed up and told me this or my, you know, so-and-so showed up and did this. Uh, we're going to look at why this happens and how this happens. Um, but the idea is um, the Lord will send strangers to us, somebody we do not know. It can be a homeless person on the street. It can be somebody knocking on your door. It can be somebody calling you on the phone for that matter. And what he is in effect doing is uh, testing you, wants to see how you're going to respond. How are you going to react um, to a situation? And, uh, a lot of people, you know, they don't think anything about being mean to a homeless person or or being mean to a drunk person or, you know, uh, or being malicious to a gay person. Well, guess what, honey? That gay person, you just uh, read the riot act and you just told off and you just preached that and said all these hateful things to, that wasn't a person at all. That was an angel that God sent to see how you'd respond and whether or not you were going to respond to that person in a Christ-like, godly, biblical manner. Okay? And so this is why the Apostle Paul said that we're to be careful. He said, be careful how you deal with people you don't know. Because the truth of the matter is that person may very well be an angel and you just don't know it, okay? So angels, this passage also helps us to understand that angels can manifest themselves in a variety of forms, in a variety of uh, fashions. Uh, they are not bound to a specific appearance, as it were. Uh, they can appear as a black man as quickly as they can appear as a white woman, just as quickly as they can appear as an Asian child, or they can appear as an old um, Hispanic lady, okay? Uh, they're not bound to any confines in terms of how they manifest themselves in appearing to we human beings. Okay, 2 Peter 2 and 4, important. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So, there have been angels who have acted inappropriately and improperly. Nowhere in that passage does it say a third of the angels. Nowhere in that passage is anything said that specifically supports the notion that Satan brought, you know, a third of the angels with him. But listen carefully, folks. That passage says clearly, clearly, clearly. I'm not making this up. It's right there in black and white that those angels that sinned are in hell in chains reserved for judgment. They're not, quote-unquote, fallen angels, i.e. demons, that are now running around doing all this wicked evil. No, 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 no. 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 Those spirits are doing what they were designed to do. These were angels that were designed to serve God, who for whatever reason, at whatever time, chose not to do as they were supposed to. And the Word of God said that the Lord puts them in hell in chains reserved for judgment. So nowhere in that do I see that fallen angels are running around doing all this evil wickedness. No. No, angels that have disobeyed. And this is where, again, the Apostle Paul said, don't you know that we're going to sin in judgment of the angels? What angels? These angels. They, they, these are the very angels that he's talking about. They're in chains. They're in hell. 
They're waiting. They're bound. They are not loose. They're not running around. They're not doing anything. They are reserved unto judgment. How much clearer can that possibly be? Okay. Second Peter 2.11, whereas angels, which are greater in power and might, Again, man is created a little lower than the angels, so the angels are greater in power and might than we are. Bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. Angels, listen, th this is so important. Again, this, this is kind of on a theological theme, but it's important to understand. People love to make accusations. They love to throw accusations around about other people. They love, uh, you know, all these conspiracy theorists, they love to throw accusations around. And, uh, you know, Biden's not a Christian. If he was a Christian, he'd feel the way I do about abortion. He may very well feel the way you feel about abortion. He just has a different belief concerning what freedom means. And freedom means if you're a human being, you have autonomy over your own body, whether I disagree with what you do with it or not, whether I believe you're you're terminating a life or not, the bottom line is, as a human being in America, you're supposed to have personal autonomy and freedom over your own body. That may very well be what he believed. Well, but he doesn't believe the way I do about abortion. He doesn't believe in doing what I think we should do about abortion and limiting what people do with their own autonomy and their own bodies. We ought to have laws that restrict what people do with their own bodies. What's next? God help us. Once you open that door, you know, the Republican Party loves to preach slippery slope, slippery slope. Every time you turn around, they're talking slippery slope, slippery slope. But when it comes to uh, taking away an individual's rights to make choices concerning their own health care, their own well-being, their own personal physical autonomy... All of a sudden, that's not a slippery slope. No, that's that's a restriction on liberties that we're safe, you know, doing. We, we need to do that, okay? Um, but the reality is angels do not accuse. Angels do not accuse. When we look in the book of Revelation, we find the word of God said that Satan ultimately is defeated and the saints rejoice because he is called the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. One of the things that Satan loves to do is to accuse God's people of all kinds of things. He loves to stand and make accusations. God's people are called not to do this. That is an ungodly behavior. That is a wicked behavior. That is right up there with lying. That is right up there with defrauding. That is right up there with cheating. Accusing is something that God's people are not to engage in. Yet you see it every day. Oh, those Democrats, they're a bunch of, you know, they, uh, they, were, they uh, offer children in sacrifice. Where in the name of Jesus have you ever seen that? Have you ever witnessed that with your own eye? Have you ever seen, if you haven't seen it with your own eye, then it's an accusation. Okay? If you've seen it with your own eye, then you're bearing witness. You're offering testimony to something that you've seen. But if you have not witnessed it with your own eye, then you are simply offering an accusation. And we live in an age today, again, where people who call themselves Christians constantly run around making the most outrageous outlandish, lunatic accusations. And then, like a herd of mindless buffalo, the rest of everybody just buys into it, believes it, because this person put words to it and spoke it and said it. 
All of a sudden now, you got this whole herd believe in this foolishness. And this is how we get all these conspiracy theories born. This is how we get all these outrageous, you know, Democrats are into um, uh, child sex trafficking and blah, blah, blah. I mean, my God, people, Jesus, help us. The church is in such pitiful shape today. The angels do not bring accusation. They know better. We ought to know better. I talked about the fact that there are times when God refers to ministers as angels. And in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and verse 20, the word of God said, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So, in this instance, he is actually referring to the ministry, the leadership over the individual churches as angels. Because, like I said, the word angels uh, basically means a messenger or a go-between, a representative of God. And uh, not all uh, angels are spirits, but, but the angels... Uh, the holy angels, God's angels, are ministering spirits. But pastors and leaders in the church are often referred to as angels as well in the Word of God. I'm, I'm trying to just go through... Okay, let's let's do this. Revelation 12 and 7. We're looking. This is the passage that is often used by fundamentalist evangelicals, uh, high church, Episcopalian, Presbyterian, all kinds of Christian theologians use this passage to suggest that um when Satan fell, he pulled a third of the angels out of heaven with him. And this is where they get their justification for that teaching. Revelation 12 and verse 7. And actually, let me see a minute. I'm actually going to look at the whole... Uh, I'm going to look at more than simply verse 7. Revelation 12, And there appeared a great woman in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled unto the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days, three and a half years, the second half of the tribulation period. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. How do we know? 
this isn't when Satan left heaven as it were when he fell originally how do we know well first of all it's very easy because Jesus said not Paul not Peter not John not Joe not you know Billy Graham Jesus said I beheld Satan fall as lightning when Satan allowed all this wickedness and all this evil into his heart he literally this is where the word of God gives us the language uh, that we're to put off all the sin and the weight which doth so easily beset us it literally in a sense was like tying weights to him so that he no longer could even remain in heaven. He literally fell from heaven. He was no longer of a nature that allowed him to stand in the presence of God. And he literally fell to earth. Okay? Nowhere in the Lord's speaking of Satan falling does it say he was cast out. Nowhere does it say that any angels went with him. But in this passage, it specifically, first of all, it's in the book of Revelation. It's talking about last day events. And it says that there was a great war in heaven. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So Michael, as a representative of the holy angels, the leader of the holy angels, fought a war against Lucifer, Satan, and his angels. Again, you notice it says, and his angels, for those of you that wanted to take offense when I said demons and devils are angels, okay? But they are. Said, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels with him and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven immediately after him being cast down and i heard a voice a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down so he's identified at the time he's cast down he's identified as the accuser of our brethren so the church already exists at this time at the time he's being cast down, the church exists, the brethren, the brotherhood, the family of God, the children of God, they exist at this time. And he has been their accuser, okay? And, he's, and it says, uh, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night so again folks this is what i mean about how careless people are christian theologians love to be careless christians love to be careless when they read their bibles but if you read it in context you can clearly see this is not talking about the fall of satan way back before at the earliest point in creation at the beginning of creation, as a matter of fact. It's not talking about that by any means. It's talking well after the establishment of the church, saying this guy has been the accuser of the brethren. This guy has been the great deceiver. Okay? So, reading that in context, again, we understand there are angels which... 
are identified as angels on the holy side, on the good side. You have angels, as it were, on the devil's side, on evil side, on wicked side. All that means is they are spiritual beings who are sent to perform tasks, to do specific tasks, okay? That's what that amounts to. Okay, I think basically those are all the angel passages that I want to look at. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm very sorry, I apologize. Turns out we went the whole um, almost 90 minutes um, just covering that. Um, we have about 10 minutes to go. So next week, we are going to move into, the again, the way I'm kind of dividing this. I'm not saying I'm the best teacher in the world or the greatest teacher in the world. I'm not saying the way I do everything is perfect or right. But this is just the way I've kind of um, organized this particular study. Instead of we're talking about the spirit world. Instead of talking God, angels, and then immediately going into the devil um, and demons and, you know, wicked spirits and what have you. Uh, what I want to do is I kind of, in the middle, the divider between God, the good, and the evil is the concept of conflict and warfare, spiritual warfare. So we need to understand. Now we understand the God side of the coin. We understand the nature of angels, the work of angels, uh, the influence of angels. We understand um, things they've done, important things they've done, and uh, how they operate, why they operate, what they're capable of doing. But now we want to look at the concept of spiritual warfare, the fact that there is a warfare that is going on. And then, as soon as we've covered this, which will probably be next week, and uh, looking at my notes real quick here, yeah, as part of that, I mean, we're, we're going to move immediately right into the devil, who is at the top of the other side of the coin, wicked, and his angels, okay? So next week should prove to be very interesting for those of you that have wanted to understand the devil. You want to understand the wicked spirits, demon spirits, uh, devils, demons, whatever word you want to apply to them. You need to join us next Wednesday night because that is when we will be uh, covering that subject matter. You know, I shared an anecdote. I've got a few minutes. I shared an anecdote with you last week concerning, you know, a pastor who was going through great trouble with his church and, and angels. Uh, the Lord sent angels to minister to that situation. And uh, I have one story I can tell you. And I, I as I have said before, I've, I do not claim to have ever been visited by an angel or spoken to it that I know of spoken to an angel or anything like that. But I have had experiences uh, that I am pretty sure angels were involved in. And one in particular that I'll just share in closing today. Um, I was serving my internship in the Church of God, headquartered in Cleveland, Tennessee. I went through an in, uh, a ministerial internship program under a pastor at a Church of God in West Haven, Connecticut, way back in the early 80s, right after um, my high school graduation year, uh, which was 83. And uh, so like 83, 84, basically they claim that it is more or less two years of Bible college shoved into less than a year. There are a number of books you have to read. You have to read through the Bible in that time. Um, you have to take tests. You go to uh, the local um, church of the uh, director of 
Christian education, youth and Christian education director for your state or for your district. You take exams. I mean, it is a really, honestly, it's an exhausting program, the internship program. Then on top of all of that, I was working a job. Uh, I was actually working as an assistant manager for a convenience store um, firm, company. And uh, and then, of course, on top of that, the pastor that you're working under uh, will assign you to any number of tasks within the church. There were times he asked me to go and visit people in the hospital who were dying. He asked me to go visit people in the hospital who were um, suffering with long-term illness. Um, he'd ask me, for instance, to maybe do nursing home ministry for a certain amount of time. He asked me to do the children's church for a certain amount of time, which I had had experience you know, doing. So I that was fun, and I did that okay. He asked me to teach a Sunday school class for a period of time, and there were any number of tasks, you know. And then, of course, uh, the church might invite you to preach, and, you know, you may be invited to preach elsewhere. I mean, honestly, that period of time, it's within a year, there is so much going on that your head is spinning. But I remember kind of whining about it a little bit to the Christian Education Home Missions Director and Christian Education Director, Brother Flynn. And Brother Flynn said there's a reason behind the Church of God doing this this way. And he said, and that is because ministry is so demanding of your time that we're trying to kind of put you to the test and help you to understand how important it is to budget your time and how to make certain that you can do what you need to do. And, you know, and it helps you to organize and it helps you to learn how to, uh, to budget your time. So the, the, re the reason the program was so compressed was on purpose. It was not by accident. Well, anyway, I was going through this program. I was a system manager, but I was serving as a interim manager at a store, one of our stores. The manager had left and they needed someone to manage until a new full-time manager came in. At the time, I didn't want to be a manager because obviously I was going through the internship program and I didn't need all that additional responsibility. So I was happy to be an, an assistant manager and they used me, however, in a couple of stores that needed a temporary manager. And so I was temporarily managing a store in Monroe, Connecticut. And uh, one evening, our church was having an all-night Bible study. It's what they call a lock-in. And that means that God's people come together for prayer. They come in, I think it was maybe around 8 o'clock at night, and they literally lock the doors to the church, not to lock people in, but to keep anybody from, you know, obviously coming in and robbing anybody or whatever, you know. They lock the doors, and we go to prayer, and we pray through the entire night. We just keep in prayer for the entire I love lock-ins. I love a good old-fashioned overnight prayer meeting. And so uh, I was driving to the prayer meeting, and uh, we were getting a real heavy snow. This is in New England, where I'm from, my home state of Connecticut. We were getting a lot of snow. It was snowing like crazy. We already had probably four or five inches on the ground. The roads were covered. I was driving a little Ford uh, Escort at the time, uh, a 1983 Ford Escort. And uh, because I was... Uh, new at this point to this particular store that I was serving in, I really didn't know the area very well. So I had, uh, this is before GPS and all that, but I had figured out a route uh, how to get from the store to the church. And I was driving, and I mean, it's snowing like crazy. The roads are slick. It was just a mess, honestly. It, it probably was the night, would have been better uh, to have stayed at the store if I, and even slept there because it was dangerous. It was very, very slick. 
Well, as it happens, I got to the exit that I was supposed to take to get down to Route 1 and then follow Route 1 straight up, basically, to where the church was at. And I had never been to this exit before, wasn't familiar with it. I got off the exit, and it turns out it was an exit, one of those that basically makes a great big circle. You know, you come off of it, and you just make a big circle, and you wind up basically traveling in the, almost the same exact direction you were traveling to begin with, but after you've made this big circle off of the exit. Well, as I come off the exit, my car suddenly lost control. And I began, I'll never forget it, the car began to spin in circles like this, just spinning around and around and around. And I'm going down a circular exit. So anybody would, would know that basically if I'm spinning around in circles, at some point I ought to just spin off and hit a guardrail, right? That would make sense. But somehow, as I'm spinning, I literally felt my car, it would go toward the guardrail, and I would literally feel my car like it bumped something in it, when it but it kept spinning. And then it went over the other side, and the same thing happened. I felt this bump, a hard bump. And this happened at least maybe, I don't know, four to six times as I'm coming around this circle. So as I'm coming down the circle, my car is spinning all the way down the side. I go close to the guardrail, boom. I go close to the other guardrail, boom. And I keep spinning. When the car finally came to a stop, you want to talk about being shaken up and spooked. I was shaken up. That about scared the life out of me. I thought I was dead. And... Um, I got to the bottom of the exit. My car was literally facing up as if I were going to drive up the wrong way up this circular exit. So I had to turn my car around, and then I finished my drive to the church. I get to the church for prayer meeting, and uh, I shared the testimony with the, the saints that were there to pray, and I told them what had happened, and I said, you know, I'd get near the guardrail, and boom, I felt this thud said my cars must my cars my tires must have hit the uh can't think of the word there you know the shoulder of the road a lot of times the curb i said there must have been a curb but i couldn't see it i said so it must have been under the snow maybe my tire hit a curb or something you know and it would bounce away from the guardrail you know well, anyway, we got to praying, and as I was praying, the Spirit of the Lord gave me a vision. And in my vision, he showed me, he's, I, I'll never forget it, talk about exciting. He showed me that as my car was spinning in circles, coming down this exit, that there were angels lined up, and I'm covered in goosebumps just sharing this testimony, there were angels, I saw them in my vision, lined up all the way down that entire exit, all the way down. And as my car would go near the guardrail, the angel would push it. <laughs> and he showed me and he said, this is what was happening. This is why your car didn't hit the guardrail. Well, that excited me. That vision excited me. But like any good Christian, I doubted it after a while. <laughs> so a couple weeks later, when the snow had melted and everything was gone, in Connecticut, snow can stay on the ground for weeks at a time because the temperatures stay cold enough for long periods of time. And when the snow had finally melted and everything, you know, and I, one day I said, uh, I wound up in a different store. I was only there for, you know, a few weeks. And then I went to a different store. And uh, I said, I'm going to go back by that store and I'm going to go that route to the church. I said, I want to see that exit. I want to see how it's laid out. 
I said, you know, maybe maybe there was a curb down on the road. And, uh, you know, as I got close to the guardrail. I mean, isn't that funny? God can show us something and we still question, we still doubt. So I went to that exit and I got off the exit and nobody was behind me. So I slowed down real good and I'm going around this exit and I'm looking. And folks, there was no curb, nothing. There was a shoulder about two feet wide on either side of the lane, but there was no curb, nothing between uh, the road and the guardrails. So that just verified what God showed me. I should have simply spun right off into one of those guardrails. Uh, probably back then we didn't have all the airbags and what have you that we have in cars today. I might very well have been killed, but angels, ministering spirits sent to minister on behalf of the children of God. Angels that are always present, always present. They're on patrol. They're available. God can dispatch them at a moment's notice. They were already. God knows the end from the beginning. He knew I was going to go into a spin before I ever hit that exit. And the angels were in place ready to protect me. Oh, I want to tell you, isn't God good? Whatever you're going through today, whatever spiritual battle you may be experiencing, whatever vexation, whatever trouble, I'm here to tell you today, there is victory in Jesus. And if you'll just believe God, if you'll take him at his word, I promise you, you can win the war. Hallelujah. You can win the battle. Stay with us for this Bible study. It does get meaty and very juicy and informative. Uh, we're about to move now into more into the specific um, items that our title alludes to. So we're going to be moving in that direction. Next week, we're going to look at spiritual warfare. We'll begin to look at the other side of the spirit world, the evil side, the, the devil side. So I hope you'll join us for that as well. If you'll go to the Lord with me in prayer, Master, we love you, God. We thank you for this time, for this uh, Bible study. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you, Master, that you have given us a timeless, ancient, established Word that we can put our faith and trust and confidence in. The Word of God tells us that your Word is tried. It has been proven over and over again to be true, and I know from my own experience that this is the case. Master, go with us from this meeting. Keep us, Lord, under your mighty hand. Protect the people of God, Master. The Word of God promises that angels encamp round about them that fear him. Keep us today in your care, Lord. Keep us by your divine power until the next time we come together to worship and praise you, to lift up your name, to study your word. For we ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I hope you'll be kind enough to join us next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time for our next Bible study in this series, Ghost Schools and Bumps in the Night. I also would like to invite you, if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, uh, if, you're, if you think you're dealing with any kind of a uh, haunting or some sort of a situation of this nature, I invite people to come to church. Our ministry is brand new to Huntsville, so you're not going to you're not going to be a whole lot of people there, and I promise you. So, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed by. There's nothing to be humiliated by. I invite you to come to church. People don't understand why I say this. This is not about building our church. This There's a reason to my methodology. There is a gift of the Spirit referred to as discernment of spirits. When an individual is vexed or troubled by demonic uh, spirits, 
The Lord, thank God, since I was a child, has allowed me to discern spirits. Uh, uh, if a person comes to a service and they're in some sort of an issue, generally, if, if they do have a real issue, I'm going to know it, okay? I'm going to be able to discern. I'm going to be able to know the Lord's going to allow me to see what's going on and, and what needs to be dealt with. It is best if you come to the house of God because you then are on neutral ground. You're not on neutral ground. You're, you're on the enemy's. Uh, you're where he doesn't want to be, okay? And uh, But you're not on your home turf where he, in a sense, has a home turf advantage, okay? So it's best that you come to the house of God. Let the man of God discern what's going on. Uh, and then from there, we can always talk after service, and we can try to develop uh, a game plan as to how it's best to help you. I'm more than happy to help anybody that's having issues in these areas. Uh, I tell you, we do not charge a dime. There's it, God's preachers of the gospel don't charge for their services, okay? People are always... Uh, you're always free to give an offering if you feel like it or if you feel led to or what have you. But we do not charge. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And that's how we operate, okay? So Sunday at 3 o'clock Central Standard Time, even if you go to another church, you can always come be with us at 3 o'clock. We don't have church like other churches. We do ours in the afternoon to accommodate work schedules in the modern world. Uh, you know, so 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, we meet at the um, Century Office Center, 3322 uh, Memorial Parkway Southwest, suite number 537. It's on the second floor center building in that complex. And uh, that is Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. And we invite you to look at our website, www.forwardclc, all one word, forwardclc.com. Check out our website and uh, come be with us and we'll be happy to help you in any way that we're able, okay? Till we meet again, God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.